Okay, everybody, I'm on with my good friend, Ringwalk John. I don't know if he wants people knowing his government name. Got a badass podcast and all that <laughs> shit. Um, how are you doing? I'm good, man. It's Jonathan Weir. It's the name that's on the uh, social media, you know. But, uh, yeah, a lot of people will just say, hey, Ringwalk. So that works well, too, you know. Either way, as long as you're calling me, I'm a happy man. Okay, because a lot of people sometimes, I don't know, I'll say someone's government name, and like, dude, I want to go by my alias. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm just an authentic person. So, <laughs> uh, But you got a really good show. It's probably like one of the three boxing programs I can listen to and actually go, okay, there's not stuff. Like sometimes people just say things that don't make sense to me in terms of the business, the structure, the mechanics of how fights are made really liked your involvement in drug testing, but I just really recommend to my eight or 10 or 15 or 20 listeners or however many I have that your show is really good. So I want to do a fun little game with you so then people can actually see how enjoyable your product is as well. I I appreciate that. Now I understand too, I, you know, you're, you're doing this live with me and I'll do that with the guests that I have on. I do not usually go into lists and you know that because you listen to the show, but it is speculative, but you know, I figured even though I don't usually do lists, it could be something fun, a little bit challenging, you know, and, uh, Let's people in at least on my thought processes, you know, in regards to the fight game, et cetera. So I'm interested to do it, Luke, and I'm here to help. Yeah, it is like real 2010 Bleacher Report. We're trying to build a dot com and sell it for big money. So that's that's the premise of this. <laughs> is that the plan here? <laughs> that is this. So we're doing the top 10 emerging fighters without a belt. I wanted to kind of use the word young, but there's a couple of fighters, I guess, that are kind of not young. I'm going to start it off right now at, or should I do my honorable, I guess we'll do the honorable mentions at the end, or do you want to do the honorable mentions now? Because I have a lot of honorable mentions. You know, to be honest, when I put together the list, uh, one, uh, I'm probably going to leave off a lot of people's, you know, their likes and dislikes. I took the approach of uh, just, you want to know, I don't even know if I have them officially listed one to ten, but I did put down just off the top of my head, guys that, I either think are going to be fantastic and belt holders in and of themselves or guys that are definitely on my watch list. You know, um, there's there's big name prospects that I know that I've left off here, and there's going to be some guys that are like, really, this guy's in the top ten. But for me, uh, just as much as, you know, the talent that they display now uh, versus where they're rated now, there might be guys that are listed a little bit higher, uh, but I just personally, there's something that I catch or there's something so explosive that I think that if they can key in on this one aspect, they could end up being, you know, really high up there. So it's it's kind of a motley crew list for me. So if we're going, you know, fighter for fighter, I might not have it ranked the exact same way, uh, you know, or officially, uh, or I, there might be some guys that are, you know, off the beaten path, but this was just my thought processes on my cell phone while the kids are, you know, doing their schoolwork upstairs, you know, type of thing. So don't hold me uh, too much judgment in this list. Okay? No, there's no judgment. It's This is more like, uh, like before you called me, I was on box rec kind of uh, looking for emerging prospects just to interview, just to get, just to see if my eye for talent is right. So this is more sure. just a fun game to see how we yeah, assess yeah. fighters. And I'm sure we're going to have really good fighters both. My number 10 guy, Edgar Berlanga mm-hmm. of top rank, all mm-hmm. first-round knockouts, big power, trained by Dre Razier, good staff, uh, great backing, terror squad, Fat Joe walks him to the ring. I think this is going to – he got in the news for the Canelo comment, but um, – I think he's going to be one of these guys. I don't know how far he's going to be one of these guys, but for sure a world champion, for sure a guy that's going to be a player in division. It just depends on of if there is someone that's ever going to be able to take his punch, which in the amateurs he ran into that person. But the fact that he's got 13 KOs all by first-round knockout, um, his last opponent, mm-hmm. Cesar Nunez, 16-1-1, and pretty impressive. So he's number 10 on my list. Yeah, and that's a good uh, a good name to start off with. Uh, he's got a lot of moxie. That's for damn sure. You know, he finally got a taste of Madison Square Garden. The knockout still came. You know, with his first step up there with Nunez, and uh, I think that it's kind of setting in on the quote unquote chosen one. You know, he's he's kind of he's he's now calling out Canelo, and he's got a little bit of swag. But you want that, you know, sometimes in these younger fighters. I'm gonna go way off the beaten path. Um, he's he's twenty. He just turned twenty six. Okay, but. Uh, I really like him, and I like his story, and I think that uh, he's he's 
there's there's another fighter, there's another two fighters in this weight class, but I really like Oshaki Foster. Uh, Oshaki okay. just turned 26. So when we talked about this, you know, I was like, damn it, is Oshaki still there? He doesn't get a lot of the pub that other guys do, but he's also had a hard life. Uh, and you talk about somebody that's come through mean streets and has dealt with some really bad shit and hasn't gotten the chance to, after, you know, doing some fights on Showbox and kind of starting to build himself out, he has a couple of losses. And so when you look at that, you go, oh, most of the time when you have somebody that's coming up, you go, he's got a couple of losses. Oh, well, he had those way back then in 2016. And he took off about, he only had one fight in between 16 and 18. And admittedly, he was getting in some really bad crowds. He's redeveloped himself, redevoted himself to the fight game. Uh, he had one of the knockouts of the year last year uh, against Texas Bravo. He is going to be a lot of fun. And there's a lot of guys that when you talk to promoters and stuff, they won't give him a shot. He is, he is that type of talented. Um, and if he can latch on with somebody and somebody really picks him up and starts pressing him like they could, I think you're going to see some really big things from Oshaki Foster. Just that's my outside, you know, that was my fringe right there on the top 10 what? for me. But, uh, to I'm, me, okay. my feeling is he's going to be the Jojo, one of Jojo Diaz's opponents in the next year. So, sure, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I love guys like Osha, Oshiki Foster other than I always mess his name up. He's like the guy mm-hmm. that you, as a, I hate to say this, with a deep side boxing nerd guy that's watching um, Matthew mm-hmm. Saeed Muhammad at night and all these guys. Those guys took losses yeah. and still were really good fighters. And yeah. it, it, sometimes guys have to lose to be tough, and that kid is the kid. Oh, yeah. You don't want a 22-year-old kid that doesn't know what life is, that thinks he's super cool. You don't want to run into the 26-year-old guy that's already been made a man at 23 and now is really yeah. having to work harder than everyone else. So I respect that pick. Yeah, and like I said, a little bit off the beaten path. I, I, you know, I've got some sentimentality in some of these because you know some of these guys are the ones that, you know, a year or two ago I started watching, having on the show, talking to them, you know, off the record, and you know, I, I just believe in them. So it's, there's a little bit of bias in that too. Yeah, that's fine. Bias never bothers me. Other people find bias wrong, but I think that people that get involved and know things about fighters, they're actually doing what you're supposed to do learning about boxing as opposed to people who are like, don't ever talk to boxers. And it's like their opinions are so terrible. Use a jab and the guy's taller than the guy. It's like you got to triple a jab. You can't just throw a single jab if the guy's longer. Just dumb stuff. But next, my next one is Sean Ergashev. He's training out of the Kronk. Um, Uzbekistan guy, 18 and 0, 16 knockouts. He's with Mark Taft. He got a win over Mike Foster, who I'm super, super high on. Kind of a close, awkward fight. He beat Sonny Fredrickson. To me, this feels like when uh, Josh Taylor, Ramirez, and all those guys leave. Uh, Ergashev mm-hmm. is going to be one of the guys when Teofimo and Ryan Garcia and Haney are all in 140, which is coming. I feel like Ergashev is going to be like the the – underground, oh, he's got to fight this guy. Kind of maybe like a Joe Kalazaki or something. Like, oh, you got, mm-hmm. but he's going to be here in America. So I'm taking Ergashev at nine. Really good fighter. Um, not sure really what his feeling is. But like, a lot I think he's good. A lot of power. Really aggressive. Got a million Instagram followers. At the Kronk gym. He's going to be wearing the yellow. He, I believe, let me see. Is he a southpaw? I feel, he fights my impression is he fight. Yeah, he's southpaw. From the right, I remembered. Power southpaw Kronk Jim. We'll put him at nine. Lots of social media. Boom. That's my yeah. name. Uh, another hard hitting kid uh, that finally is starting to get a little bit more pub uh, through Showtime is Brandon Lee. He has not had the type of opponents uh, as, as far as competition that one would like to see when I'm putting him up on like this one, one of these rising star lists. Uh, but boy, that kid got power for days. And so I, I, like I said, I've been looking at names and they're all over. Like he's, I, when I wrote out the 10 names, like it was the third name that popped up, but I figured it was a good time to give you that name just because you talk about freaky power, which other show had. And, um, Brandon is well-spoken. Uh, he, gosh, he's going to be ultra marketable. And, 
every single time that he comes in, it's lights out. You know that it's going to be a knockout. The guy has got phenomenal skills. He just hasn't really had the chance to show it up against top competition. Showtime started pushing him towards, you know, the beginning of this year. And then, yeah, we know what happened after that. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to see his career continue. Young kid, smart kid, real strong. And uh, excited to see what the, uh, what the tall, you know, super lightweight is going to do. He's, he's going to be a lot of fun to watch. And he's from, and honestly, him versus Ergashev is going to be the fight. That's going to be like the graduation <laughs> fight. That's yeah, going to be, be. Cause they're both show box fighters. They're yeah, both they the smaller promoters. I mean, between, I feel like Brian Sabello versus Boots Innes and Ergashev. Which is one of the other names. Brandon. I, yeah, oh, which is one of my other names on the list, the Sabayo. Uh, he had a few fantastic fights last year. Uh, came out on the scene early um, on the zone, what was it, end of 2018. And, uh, yeah, then I, and I saw him. He was on he was on my show a couple of times, and he's got some real skill. I mean, I talked to a couple of guys that said, watch him. You know, a lot of times, Sabayo's name gets passed over. I'm glad that you said it. Uh, he's got he's phenomenal talent, and I really like him. He's one of the other names on the list. I, I, I guess I just like that, that class right now, too. A lot of skill, a lot of good guys coming up there. Yeah, um, so one last thing about Ryan and Lee's. From where I yeah. went to elementary school, Yuba City, California. So shout out to that. Yeah. He could. Yeah. So. Well, see, I knew I was going to be on your show, and so I wanted to put in a little bit of local flavor. Yeah. Well, I don't live there anymore, but that would have been a hell of a deep dive if you knew that. <laughs> improved. My number eight guy is probably I'm the only person really riding for this guy because it's super confusing. Gary Antoine Russell, uh, 2016 Olympic medalist. He's – Pretty much a southpaw version of Gar- uh, Virgil Ortiz, but he's just not getting big fights, so no one really is caring. But what do you think? That, of- well, I think that it's inactivity, super confusing because of like there's three Gary Russells currently, and I think that <laughs> Gary Antoine Russell, the super lightweight southpaw, is probably the most promising. Gary's probably Gary's. Mm-hmm. Junior is his coach, and then so like his last fight, he beat sure. this guy Jose Marufo, who fought my friend Willie Shaw. The first fight was a, a Marufo beat Willie Shaw because the guy comes into camps to emulate um, Granados. So pretty much all the pro camps bring in Jose Marufo because the kid throws a lot of punches. So Willie didn't throw enough punches. The guy gets a close decision. Willie beats him. Uh, Gary Antoine Russell stops him in a round. So that just shows yeah, you from the club level the to um, the elite level, that's how he is. To me, he's a lot like Earl Spence, only he's more patient, uses a jab, and it's like he's a real killer. But why I brought up that Marufo fight wasn't even to stay all that information. For that fight, he was the first fight of the night because Gary Jr., who coaches him, was the main event. So there's often situations where he has to fight earlier in the night because he's on a card with his brother who coaches him. Mm. So yeah, I just, I feel like Gary and Gary Antoine Russell has two wins over boots in us. Who's higher on my list. I mean, this is a guy who yeah. he really, to me could be a superstar in boxing, but there's no, he, I'll tell you the perfect guy. He reminds me of, he reminds me of Michael Hunter because I've known Michael Hunter for a long time. And I've always felt like Michael Hunter could really do something. And it really hasn't been until this year that there's been any momentum with his career. And Gary Antoine Russell feels like this really, really good guy. Like there's no, the only difference between him and Berlanga is Berlanga is doing every knockout in the first round, but he's 13 and 0, 13 KOs. And he's not, he's a three star box rec fighter. I mean, this isn't like, you know, no, what I mean? yeah, and, I hear you. And he, it's not like he's Russell's been knocking guys out pretty damn quick himself. So uh, he, it was a great name that wouldn't have come to the top of my head. But you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, I, it's probably because there's really too many K Russells on the brain. But yeah, that's a that's a good pick. I haven't even thought about that one. But I mean, that's um, why I bring him up just because it's like it's so easy to look past him because it's like yeah, yeah I hate to say from marketing that's they should do Antoine Russell. They should just take the Gary out. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, the youngest name that I'll have on here, and it's easy to go with a name like this, right? But uh, call me 
when you talk about a career, uh, you also have to look at like the realistics of that person being marketable. Um, marketability gets you big fights, and if you have enough talent in those big fights, you can have a great career. It's it's sad but true. I mean, there's guys with the skill set of like say Ryan Garcia, right? Uh, not maybe not as good, but he's propelled much quicker because of you know his looks, his social media skill set, what have you. Uh, I think that Xander Zayas is trying to put himself in a position where he can be, you know, he's, he's going to be set up. First of all, he's from every single mouth out there. This was the guy that people were willing to throw millions of dollars at at 17 years old, if not younger, to get them on their roster for the future. Just you talk about a blue chip prospect in baseball, you know, the five tool guy, the one that you wouldn't trade a superstar for, you're keeping him because you know, he's going to turn into something. That's what Top Rank has with Xander Zayas. And he's young. <laughs> you haven't seen him fight a lot. Nobody has. He's, you know, obviously, he just had his pro career. Uh, but if you're taking a, a, a realistic look at who could be a champion down the road, this is, about as a lot, like, this is about as much of a reach as I would take on somebody so young. But knowing his marketability, knowing how personable he is, if you've had the opportunity to talk to him yourself or if you've, you know, listened to him, He's, he knows everything to say, has everything, you know, nailed down and not like a computer, super just, you've got an infectious, you know, sense about him that you just, you like this kid. And then you see, oh my God, he's got a skill set to match to. Uh, if I'm taking, if I'm putting together a roster, you know, of 10 fighters I'd like to invest in for the future, I'm investing early in the stock because uh, it's got all the makings and trappings of being something really fantastic. Yeah, I mean, he's really good. I remember I was in camp with him, and uh, he's good. He's really good. He's uh, genuinely a teenager. He's, like, really nice, like an innocent teenager. (laughs) He has a lot of really good skills, and it's the scary thing is he's probably, like, a third of what he will be, and JC is kind of really good, and it's just, like, he's humble. He's going to grow into that manhood. It's going to be scary. But, like, when I watch him in the gym, not to – like go into different stuff or say things. I mean, he's still, he doesn't think like an adult, like he's still kind of (laughs) using athletic and this will harp into someone higher on my list, but he's using a lot of athleticism with skill, but there's like a, like he's having to work too hard. What I noticed in the gym with a lot of young fighters, you see young fighters working harder than they have to. And then you see a guy like B hop who fought in his forties, who doesn't even ever have to have the pace pushed because he knows just how to simply step or how to move back and then put pressure back on you. So it's like when he starts to involve some of those, which I know his high level coach JC has, that's when it's going to be like, okay, we're running into a guy who has the chance to do really great things in the sport of boxing. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So now my next one is kind of like the hipster pick at seven. I got Israel Mara Moff. And I've been on this guy for a long time because he turned pro in a 10-round bout for a form of a title. And he's really good. He's a 154-pounder who's really good. Um, just kind of like the classical lives lives boxing, Eastern European, who doesn't seem to have any form of a social life and is obsessed with being really, really good. And I think that he's going to be a very, probably going to be like the Demetrius Andre of 154, where it's going to be like people just are only going to fight him if they're stuck on the DAZN side. And that's going to be his career. It's going to be, for a while, people are going to avoid him in his prime, but he is very, very exceptional. Yeah, uh, Israel is was on my list, and I have him as my number four. Uh, I guess if I'm looking at this because I can see the other names, some of the names that you've already said, I'm beyond high on him. The only thing that he does is probably a little bit too much footwork right now. His footwork is so like when you watch him fight, he's you don't want to say he's a poor man's anything because what he does is not a poor man's anything. He's phenomenal, but he almost is doing the Lomachenko esque footwork, but to an extreme. He's he, there's a little bit of wasted movement. Uh, that being said, uh, I, I'm, I'm a gym guy. You know that. I'm a, I'm a personal trainer, and, and I've been working in fitness for years. The stuff this guy does is freaky. 
if you just you know creep up onto a social media and you watch uh, the physical specimen this guy is outside of the ring, and then you see the tools that he brings over inside of the ring. Holy hell! I, I'm I'm he's one of the more fun guys for me to watch. I uh, you're right. There's going to be a lot of guys who do not want to touch him because he is going to be confusing, frustrating. It, much like so many of the fighters, you know, coming out of the Uzbek area. But, uh, God, I, I, I really am high on him. So uh, you and I are in a big agreement on, on Madrimov. I think the reason that makes him so problem is he, the kid can box. He's, like, he's, you're not going to be stronger than him. If you saw that push-up video he did, like, that just doesn't make That's what mad. I was talking about. Yeah, with the barbell work he does with his forearm, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's just like, so you're not going to be stronger than him. You're not going to have probably a higher boxing IQ. And so far, he doesn't have a bad chin. So it's like you just kind of have to go in with supreme confidence that you're going to wear on this guy or you've got some tactic. But, man, that's a hell of a, just a hell of an equation because he turned pro. I believe his pro debut was against a guy who beat a former top-ranked fighter, Daniel Valdivia, twice. That was his pro debut was against a guy who basically uh, Vladimir, what was that? Vladimir Hernandez. Hernandez. So he beat this guy that beat a guy who was signed to top rank, who was basically on his way to getting a big fight. And then this is who this guy chooses to to make his pro debut with. And I think he stopped him in like seven rounds. So in his first level, he was already higher than a signed top rank prospect at one time. And that's just, that's, that's your entry level into the sport. To me, that's pretty like, okay, we got something. So, yeah, he's really good. So, number six for me is... Well, that was both of us, you know. <laughs> okay. So, you can go. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going number six, Little B-Hop, Chris Colbert. Um, one of the best yeah, jabs in boxing. Too. So, yeah, that's... I mean, he's just good. That's it. Like, he's good, he's fast, he's going to be really hard to beat. He uh, he did it, like obviously it's hard because when you have that much attention on you uh, and you're coming up the way that you did and he had the you know the big you know freaking knockout last time uh, before his last fight and everybody just got super high which happens you know after you do knock somebody out like he did what that last fight that he was in um, it, it showed that you know while he's still got all the tools. The difference when you step up in competition is there, right? And you you can kind of see where, okay, we can be high on this guy. Just make sure that we're not pushing the cart too quick. And that does happen. You know, you'll, you'll get guys who are young. You know, this guy's 23. And maybe you say, you know what, maybe now's the time. Maybe now's the time that we put him in there and, you know, throw everything after it. And... In his last fight, there were some things that go, okay, maybe we pump the brakes here. You know, he's, he can absolutely get caught. Uh, there's times where he doesn't know uh, when to push the gas versus when to let off and push the brakes. But he's fun. He's on my list, too, so I'll just go along with the same rating. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm high on Chris. Yeah, I mean, to me, he's one of these guys. I believe Sosa's his coach. Sosa's going to be one of these emerging coaches that people will say, where did he come from? Because he's got like 10 great fighters that come out of nowhere. It's like, well, he's been in the amateurs, buddy. Like he's been, um, he's, um, yeah. he's been doing really, really, you know what I mean? So it's like, we got Colbert, we got all these guys. To me, it's the jab and the fact that his legs move with his jab. Um, he's got flaws, but the fact that, he has one strong attribute most fighters don't have, and then a personality. I think he's pretty high. The only red flag for me is that Netflix documentary where he was talking about, I don't need to go to school, I'm going to be a millionaire boxing, and then he's kind of like having trouble in camp with Payano, I believe it was. And it was like, uh-oh, if this kid gets $2 million, he might be the classic, doesn't train hard after that. Sure, sure. So, I didn't see that, so I can't, I won't speak uh, educatedly on it. Uh, I don't know. There's some guys you hear about there, you know, outside of the ring antics, but uh, as far as the skill set, man, you're right, and hopefully he doesn't have anything to do with that. Number five, I got Ruben Villa, multiple-time national champion, signed with Thompson and Banner. Um, he's a really good southpaw. Like, I think he's probably one of the three best amateur boxers I ever saw. 
And I think that he's right up there with any of these guys at the top of the list. It's just that the exposure fighting on Showbox and fighting on Facebook. And I think he's unfairly getting labeled as a boxer, which nowadays that's an insult because people assume you can't punch if you box. But he accumulates a lot of punches on people and they wear the damage. And then they make decisions not to engage. But Ruben Villa is number five for me. So who you got? He's well. He's out of. Is he also out of you? He's in Salinas. Is that where he's? Yeah, from? Salinas, California. Yeah. yeah. All right. I didn't know if you had a little bit of that, you know, hometown flair again. And uh, he well, I've known him, I've known him since just, he was like thirteen. But I, I truly believe that he's one of the most talented that I've seen since. Sure. Uh, but I mean, I'll well, gladly take the hometown bias on that one for sure. No, yeah, for sure, for sure. So he wasn't necessarily, and I, again, I, I apologize because, you know, some of the guys that I had already said, you know, were either higher or lower on the list, and then I was matching you. So it's thrown off my numbers a tiny bit, okay? Um, but uh, one that is, you know, more towards, I guess, the mid to bottom of that list for me is uh, Cool Boy Steph. Uh, I got a chance to – I covered the uh, Herb Williams fight last year, and I was – I was at, uh, I was there ringside and he was like fourth or fifth down, you know, and this is, you know, year and some change. And uh, I go and I watched him and I'm like, guy, this guy has got such a jab. I mean, he pretty much won with one punch. He did the same thing against the guy. Uh, and he's not afraid to say it, but, um, the, with each opportunity that he's been given, he's shown what his skill set is. And you talk about the fun division where you can find out really quick how good you are. I mean, he's going to be – the PBC knows what they have with him. I think a lot of people didn't know, but uh, the PBC does. And I'm, I'm about as – I think that he's still coming into how good he can be. And uh, right now he's actually facing – and he's had the opportunity now to face some really good condition and have one got – and pretty much wins with – Really good footwork and uh, a strong jab. I mean, that's how good this guy is. And I think, I think it's only a matter of time before he gets a shot at a belt. Um, you know, over there with the PBC, they they know what they have and they're bringing him along quite well. Yeah, I mean, I think that what's interesting about both of our picks, Ruben and Cool Boy Steph, is they basically occupy the same space, and realistically, they could fight each other in the next year or two. Even though Steph and is not the first time that we've done that either in this list. That's the second time that we've done that, you know, picking out guys that might end up going up against each other. Yeah, so that, well, I mean, I, that's yeah. kind of natural. It's like oftentimes people think of prospects and they assume they'll never fight each other, but the natural progression for every great fighter is there has to be a great foe. So it is kind of yeah. natural that if we find guys at the same weight. My number four, Gabe Flores Jr., 16, signed with top rank at 16 years old. A uh, tremendous mm-hmm. heartwarming story. One of the best amateurs, him, Shakur, and Ruben Villa were the best. Ruben Villa was 2-2 two and two with Shakur. Shakur was just so damn dominant in international competition, and Gabe Flores Jr. felt like the next generation of kind of what they were doing. Got offered a great deal. Uh, I know a lot of people have talked about his power. Now, this is something I wanted to talk about because of Xander, how Xander's athletic. To me, Gabe Flores Jr. fights like a 30-year-old man and is learning how to be athletic. And that's impressive to me because when you look at a 20-year-old kid, you never really think of them kind of learning the athletic side of things and not the thinking side. And to me, that just means the growth potential for him is really high because you can train the body much easier than you can train the brain. He, I mean, it, like I said, when I'm putting together this list while I'm driving around, you know, and doing stuff around the house, it's such an obvious name to put right up there. Uh, he's got, he, he, you're right. I do think power, you know, immediately when you say his name, um, I think he might, I don't ever want to say that he, he's going to have, it really depends on the promotions and which way, you know, they want to play it right now. Everything's up in the air, obviously, because we don't know, you know, how quickly he's going to get a shot now because everybody's in this backlog jam of when fights are going to be coming about. He was somebody that I was like, okay, towards maybe the end, when we were coming into this year, you know, towards the end of 2020, 
early 2021. Let's see what, you know, how they're bringing him along. Let's see what happens. I don't know when he's going to get the shot now, but he was one of the ones that you would realistically think that it was going to be coming soon. And he has the power. It's all about who, how that scheduling works and who who's realistically going to put their name, reputation, everything on the line with that power. Um, and that, I guess that can be said for a lot of the guys on this list because, you know, the guys above them know that they're good and that they're coming up to take their belt. But he was obviously a name that was right there uh, for me as well. Um, the the name that might not be as high, I, I you know, like I said, I apologize for the ratings, you know, system of it. He probably would be a little bit lower, but you know, I need to knock off a name off the list anyway before I get to the big dogs. Uh, is Lorenzo Simpson. I love the truck. I I, I was turned on to him by uh, Abraham Gonzalez, uh, great guy. Uh, hey, Abe, because uh, Abe listens to everything. Abe's all over boxing, so hi, Abe. Uh, but he, a long time ago, was like, man, watch out for the truck, man. Just watch out for the truck. And so far, so good. And he's exactly that. Uh, strong southpaw, super middle, um, comes out of Baltimore, and he's a man. He, every time that you tune in, he's got a little bit of attitude, you know, before and after. He's got swag, and he's got power. He's got a skill set. Uh, he's one of, definitely one of my top ten uh, guys that personally uh, I have a big interest in and uh, think uh, this guy's one of for. So I have a funny story about Truck. I was in camp with Truck, and I was filming him, and they are doing these resistance bands, and I was getting in front of him, and he tried to act like he was going to run me over, and I'm like, oh, Truck's a little bit of a bully. I like that in fighters. Like, he was doing it in a mm-hmm. sweet way, but it was like he was really trying to get to True. The- and it's like, I was like, sure. you need a little bit of that animalistic, like, I'm not going to take anything yeah, boxing, like, you know? Right. Like, Absolutely. He, uh, it's one of the things, certain fighters, you like how, you know, professional they are or how, you know, for whatever reason, certain fighters, they, they carry themselves with a certain moxie and you appreciate that because it's that fighter. You might not like it in somebody else. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the way that uh, Lorenzo goes about doing his business, there's a little bit of that swag, and uh, like you had you know mentioned, and I just personally I I, I think it's going to work out well for him, and it matches his fighting style, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what's next for him. He's he's definitely one of the special fighters. He was definitely in my honorable mentions along with guys like Xavier Martinez, Luis Feliciano, those type of guys, Michael Rivera. But it's like when you make this top 10 list, it's really hard because it's like you're picking between like, do I want Rocky Road ice cream or do I want cookie dough? Yeah. It's like they're both. Really oh, yeah. Hard. Like, and that was, that's probably why I added in names uh, like Sabio and Lee and Zayas because there's, there's prospect rankings, right? Like tools and skill sets. And then there's marketability. There's what I preferably, you know, enjoy watching or, when I watch a certain fighter that, you know, fights this style or has this type of attitude or do I think that he's marketable, there's so many variables. And it is, it's one of the, it's one of the reasons why I don't usually get into the subjective nature of it because there's no way you can say, well, no, this is the way that the ranking should be. You know, um, a more preferably I say, you know, this is realistic. And if you want to match, if you want to swap, you know, numbers three through 10 around or throw somebody else in, you're not going to get a, the quarter from me you know it's 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 all realistic when we're talking about prospects well i think that really the premise and we'll get to the top three now is just for people that enjoy this program just here are some fighters if you see their name pop up on the schedule or on your tv screen know that maybe like this isn't a fight to just turn the channel and play xbox like that's really yeah, because like, yeah, there is yeah. a lot of boxing fans who turn into the main event now i happen to be one of those guys that watches everything from the undercard on and makes my own assessments and all that. And that's for whatever reason, but there's a lot of people that only watch one fight. And this is, I just feel like this is a nice way for, I remember when I was young, I'd read ring magazine and it would say like, watch out for Felix Trinidad. And I'd look and I'd go, Oh wow, Felix Trinidad's fighting. And then when he turns into a star, you're like, I got to watch out for him and read a tiny blurb about him. So I I, just lineage. Yeah. So, oh no, for sure. Well, uh, as a as a growing up a baseball fan, you always watch the prospects at spring training because then you would know, you know. Oh yeah, you know I followed Kershaw back when he was nothing. He was nineteen out of Dallas, Texas. You know, like there's there's certain things that you just it it makes the sport fun, especially when you're trying to get more involved in it and not just watch the pay per views. So I'm with you on that. Who's uh, if we're talking top three? three how are you, number three, boots. We got boots in it. Yeah. 
he possibly like these three through one for me all could be one, mm-hmm. but Boots hasn't been as promoted as well as the top two guys on my list. He's passed every mm-hmm. test. He looks the part of a superstar. To me, him versus Terrence Crawford basically has to happen in two to three years. I think that's a big, big fight. I think he's probably going to fight Sabalo. He's probably going to fight one other guy. And I think he has the chance to be the guy that might dethrone or be in the mix with Crawford in a few years. So I really think a lot of Boots, but at the same time, Boots has to really understand, which I believe he does because he's from a family of boxing, with the praise he's getting right now, he still has to be hungry because he hasn't earned that yeah. that world title. So my only fear is that Boots is starting to get a little too much praise, and I don't want him to lose focus because I think he has the chance to be a special fighter. Who do you got at three? Okay, so like you said, I'm I'm going to just – I don't want to switch it off and then have to talk about Boots Ennis again, okay? Yeah. If we're talking about uh, the eye test, you know what I mean? Uh, mm-hmm. Just on that. You look at his last fight against uh, Ubov, that was the name of the guy. Bektar. Uh, and I think, yeah, Bektar Ubov. Yeah. So when I saw Ubov fight the first time, he is unconventional, weird fighter, right? But... He's a guy, is a rock and sock and robot, and he's very hard to handle. You know, a lot of people, it was Sabayo, the, the aforementioned Sabayo had, fight, uh, had fought you off, right? Fought three minutes um, before that. But like a yeah, very yeah. hard fight. And so, yeah. yeah, and when you watch the absolute destruction that he does, it is hard not to sit there and go, holy shit, this kid's a superstar. I haven't gotten the chance to watch him. All of these problems about why isn't he not, uh, why is, in any other sense, you would have seen this kid already. I mean, if if the right promotional agent has him, he might have a belt around his waist right now. Um, you know, if he had been getting the fights that he needed, didn't have the inactivity, didn't have all these issues with promotions, he might be right there right now. Um, and if you are... I mean, you know, my, my podcast, I'm a gambler, right? There is few people that I am going to be laying money on against this kid right now. Um, because as a physical specimen, uh, he's intimidating. And I think that whatever he might lack as far as experience, he's the type of guy that can athletically almost make up for it. He looks so damn good. I mean, sharp, crisp, puts you know, multiple punches together, uh, defensively, you know, I, I think we, he hasn't met his ceiling yet. I, I'm about as high as can be. Uh, and you talk about being able to rotate three through one. I had him at, uh, as far as guys that are going to get a belt or have the skill set or, you know, whatever the case, maybe I had him at number one. And that there's nothing wrong with it because my reasoning for not putting him on one was simply political in the sense that, <clears throat> he hasn't not that I'm aware of he hasn't filled up a bigger place yet he hasn't had to carry sure. someone oh, yeah. back yeah, yeah, yeah. he hasn't had to 100%. do the Wednesday Thursday Friday sure he probably does it for these showbox cards but I'm saying he hasn't had to do where you've got 20 to 40 media <laughs> members and you have to say mm-hmm. no to some people like that's when to yeah. me you become a star when it's like you don't get to do the small media outlet like you or me anymore you have to do that in a group and then you do the mandatory um bigger media because now it's a job and it's not up to you those guys come on your time when you clock in you have to do the ones that are media partners so i'm just kind of waiting for him to deal with the stress of those bigger shows but when billy briscoe one of one of the best boxing trainers in my opinion billy briscoe says this kid is special I mean, that to me says a lot because Billy's someone that I I shut up and listen to. I'm with you. Um, If if we're saying number three, I'll tell you why I put this guy as number three. And I actually don't have him as number three. I really had a top two, and you're probably going to have the same. But when you had messaged me, you talked about guys that didn't have a belt, 25 and under, right? With the exception, maybe not 25 because you wanted to talk like Urshev, and I said, okay, because... I was going to throw in guys that I like. <laughs> that might be 26. But you want to talk about a guy who's got potential to make the most money, uh, to 
come in on the heels of a crop in his division that are getting a little bit long in the tooth and that has already been demonstrated a skill set that he's right there for a belt and God was about to face off with another prospect. Uh, I have to look at where boxing makes all of its money, uh, you know, theoretically, where it leads from the top down. The trickle down economy of boxing is from the heavyweights. And I mean, if you're looking at a 25 year old uh, that can, you know, it, under the premise that we were talking about is, you know, the best without a belt, you know, and that's got the, you know, best opportunity to get belts, et cetera. Talk about impact on boxing, everything like that. It's hard not to put a heavyweight like, you know, a boy up there at uh, the top three. I, I, for me, it's, there's been a lot of prospects that have come into the heavyweight division, right, uh, that don't look the part for me. Like, I got really excited about, like, guys like F.A. Jogba. You know what I mean? I said, oh, you yeah, know, man, that I test, flip, man. whatever. And I was like, no, I don't, I'm not with those guys. But the one that has come out at 22 and been fantastic and done everything that he has to so far is Daniel DeBois. And I think for me, if I'm looking at the bet, like the guys that are going to be something that are under 25, can win a belt, that show me skill set, and is going to be coming in at the right time. Uh, he's going to get a chance to fight Joyce. I, I heavily favor him against Joe Joyce. He is, you know, he's, he is primed to be something really fantastic and might be able to continue after like, say, uh, the Tyson Fury, you know, age, the, you know, Anthony Joshua age, it, it looks like the Europeans are going to be keeping, you know, heavyweight belts for a long time. That's my own personal take on things. And like I said, I'm going to put some stuff in here that maybe not a lot of people would go with. I really like Daniel Dubois career arc right now at 22. I think he's primed to be one of the most successful financially, uh, get a championship belt and, uh, really take over a division for a while. What do you say about that one? That one's way out of the way out of left field. What do you think? I think it, I think that's a good pick. I think I'm typically a little U S biased just because it's easier for me to watch the fights. I think he definitely deserves to be on the top 10. I'll just be honest. Like I'm a little bit regional specific. I watch pretty much everything in U.S. Sure. boxing. This guy feels sure. like he has everything. Like I like Joe Joyce a lot. Joe Joyce was one of the nicest people I ever met when I was in Big Bear. He actually, I won't say the story, <laughs> but he had my back when there was an awkward situation in the gym. And I well, that's the guy that you want to have him back. <laughs> oh look, <Boy. laughs> Joe. But the thing about Joe Joyce is he's a weird guy in the sense not weird like weird. I hope I don't – I hope I'm going to make it. But um, the weird thing about Joe is he's like a big teddy bear. He's like the sweetest guy I'd ever met. I almost felt bad when I when he was going to spar, and then I sure. forgot he was a pro boxer. I'm like, oh, is he – Well, the problem is with Joe, not that we're trying to derail, but the problem is, is he fights about as slow as a bear. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's resting in hibernation, and I think Daniel's going to be a, uh, way too much uh, for Joe. Joe. That's, my, that's my own opinion on that. You okay over there, buddy? I really hope I Nowadays, am. if you're coughing, if you're coughing, that's a scary thing nowadays. People run away from you if you're coughing. That's, uh, well, that's terrifying stuff. I'm quarantined <laughs> right now. What it, what I think it is is I'm an avid coffee drinker, and um, I got to the bottom of my first cup of coffee, and then I'm finishing mm. up this podcast, and it's like when I don't get that second cup of coffee, my body starts doing a weird thing from caffeine addiction. <laughs> So that's okay. my guess. Okay. Yeah, but um, so Dubois, I should have really muted yeah, my phone like... soon. But uh, yeah, he's good. He's good. He's a, he's a guy. Like he's a guy. Uh, America, like we got Richard Torres coming up. We got Amasel Menez coming mm-hmm. out of Puerto Rico. Those are our only real guys I see emerging. I think Antonio Mer- Merlis is six seven marathon runner. He went to the trials, but there's no real guys in America right now. We don't really have a capital. No, there's guy. not. Yeah, and when we're talking about top 10s under 25 that can get a belt, that can have a career, you know, like I said, it's it, there's other guys. I, For example, like the aforementioned uh, when we were talking about Madrimov, I think Madrimov's a better prospect. But if we're talking about, uh, you know, a guy that's going to storm on, make 50 to $100 million, you know, on a contract signing and is – primed because he's going to be 22. He's going to finally start getting some good competition over there. 
but it's still probably two to three years away, maybe, well, at this point, the way things are going, from, you know, going up against a like of an Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury will be done by then. He's, he's going to have the time. He's going to be lined up perfectly. And uh, I think he's, the sky is the limit for that guy. And uh, he's going to make a lot of money uh, in the kind of bellwether category uh, for boxing, which is the heavyweight. Can I share a not so funny story that I'm going to refer to as funny, and then it'll just be like it's your oh, show, buddy. whatever. Well, okay, but I was trying to be real, real hospitable. So, um, <laughs> what's it called? Uh, the guy. So I grew up skateboarding, and there was a guy that skateboarded with me, and his name was Daniel Dubois. And it's that kind of messes with me. I know that shouldn't mess with you. Like you should be professional <laughs> enough. It's not bad. But it's kind of weird that like a five foot four skateboarder that was professional that I skateboarded with as a kid, and then he went on to do things. Kind of weird that a big black guy that's a knockout artist that's a heavyweight has the same name as him, and that also sure. kind of affects me. And I know that's like there's nothing that he can do about it, but it's like my own bias is like I'm like – it's kind of like when a guy gets drafted into the NFL or the NBA. I look at their name, and I think, is that a superstar's name? Like Zion Williamson, you're like, that's a superstar. <laughs> That's a superstar name. Yeah, that would happen. Then when you get like Ben Simmons or Joel Embiid, I'm like, I don't know if that's the super. And now I'm not saying there are superstars that emerge from that. Even another one would be like Pat Mahomes, right? Ah, that's a kind of a tricky name. He beat the name test. But for me, right or wrong, I have a name test. If it doesn't roll off the tongue, it's like a strike against you. And I know that doesn't sound fair, but I'm just being me. Hey, that's you. Fair enough, man. And like I said, it's your show. You can you can hate a guy if you want to. I mean, no, you're not going to get any flat from me. You have your right. I don't hate nobody because it's like this is what <laughs> a lot of people about boxing don't understand. Boxing's entertainment, and I'm just trying to facilitate entertainment around something I love. If there's a fighter out That's there it. that I don't like, why would I spend precious moments of my life facilitating negativity rather than being an ambassador of goodwill and spreading positivity about something I love. Like that, it does no positive if I just bring hatred to something I love. It's, I just, if someone doesn't like me and there are a couple of boxers that don't like me, we just don't really focus on them unless they've done something great. And then we acknowledge them in a positive, even if they don't like me, because even if I don't like someone, I'm not the type of person that won't look down upon someone accomplishing something great. It's just fact. It's like truth. Yeah. So my number one guy, and then we'll get you out of here, is uh, Ryan Garcia. I think Ryan Garcia is the number one guy on my list. He's the capital G guy. Obviously big ticket seller, but I also think his skill sets are rapidly improving. And I just think that he's the guy of the generation right now. Probably when he loses, it'll turn someone into a Marco Antonio Barea type figure where they'll become a legend basically off beating him. But he feels like the sure. guy right now. So I, you, I left Ryan off the list. And it's interesting because I was like, wait a minute. You didn't say the name that I thought you were going to say. I, I oh, wait. I, I, said I Ryan actually skipped earlier. number two. So I'll, we'll do a, a Okay, one I was going to say. Um, okay. My number so, two guy, so you have, Virgil Ortiz. Yeah, there he is. There he is. Okay, so that's my number two as well. So I was like, you left Virgil Ortiz off of the list. But you can say the same thing to me. So we'll start with Ryan Garcia. The reason I left Ryan Garcia off the list, okay? Um, his last two KOs, pretty damn impressive, right? And you go, oh, man, maybe he's not, um, maybe he's not just a good-looking kid. Maybe he is really what everybody says he is. He's such an obvious pick for the top ten. You know, and then I'm like, okay, well, if I really am ranking, like, of course I would have Ryan Garcia over the, some of the names that I listed, right? The, the drawback for me with Ryan Garcia uh, and why he's not like a personal, like, hey, I'm, I'm watching him all the time or I like him at number 10. Uh, the Afro, like we had talked, the aforementioned issues uh, that some of the fighters are having outside of the ring. This kid uh, is a PR nightmare. Uh, he is 
as great as he is with social media in getting fans, I believe he gets fans because of his looks and not because always the quality. I mean, he's had now over the last year three times where he's going back and forth with boyfriends of an ex-girlfriend on social media posting videos. He had the bad issue with his you know, baby mama. Does that affect things? Not always, but it's not a good sign either. It's one of the, you know, constant issues with Tink Davis and people think, well, okay, then you're being an anti PBC guy. No. Tink now has got, you know, abuse, you know, on his case. That that's something that hurts you. Yeah, and I and I know that those things take away from focus inside of the gym. Now luckily, uh, in the case of Brian Garcia, he's with one of the best with Reynoso. And he's you've seen, you know, some obvious growth there. The other issue for me with uh, with Ryan is that he is in a weight class where I do not think that there's so many guys here that he's going to have to start really. You know, we'll see. I, I I when I was looking at the top ten, I'm like, okay, guys that can get a belt soon. You know, guys that are going to be, you know, successful in in the division. That is stacked, and I I would put him, you know, right now, obviously, like maybe fourth. Fifth, sixth, you know, down that line, and then you look and you go, man, he's got a lot going up against him. So, he's an obvious top ten prospect for you know anybody. But I guess the reason I left him off the list is I look at him and I go, maybe it's because he's got the millions of followers, maybe he's you know because he's marketed as the next golden boy, or maybe you know it's because I I, I haven't completely bought into what they're going to try to make him to be. That'll happen when everything comes comes to fruition, where he grows up a little bit more uh, outside of the ring. We see a little bit more of him growing up into his man muscle inside of the ring, and then he goes up against those top flight opponents. And I don't think Lenares was going to be that for him. So I'm not too upset that he's not going to be fighting him. I think he gets a brush up here on 4th of July, and he could go up against somebody really good. That's what I would like to see. So I'm, well, I'm with you on the pick. Just, you know, those are my issues with, uh, if we're trying to find negatives, those would be why I, you know, didn't place him up really high. Ryan, to me, is going to be a guy who I think his whole career, people are going to like, like look at him as overrated because he'll get a lot of things, kind of like De La Hoya. Mm -hmm. And then by the time his career's over, he'll be underrated like De La Hoya. Because when you look back mm -hmm. in hindsight, people, because like Oscar De La Hoya's career is now underrated in history. Because during the time, everyone spent their time while he was fighting saying, well, he's not that good. Yeah. And then you look, and it's like, well, he fought Sugar yeah. Shane twice. He fought Tito. He fought all these guys. No, and it's like, well, he fought that. Well, I forget what the guy from Denmark was, Jimmy something or another. Well, he fought this guy, but he was a world champion, and it was like in seven fight. So I think that Ryan Garcia, albeit he's not on the same path, the world's not the same way. There's a lot of talent yeah. there. And the thing that about oh, yeah. Ryan that's interesting for me is it's really hard to hit him with a right hand. He's got like a little tricky shoulder thingy that he does, and it's very, very tough to um, to catch him. And it's like just adding a little bit to that kid's speed, we're looking at a hard fight for three to four years. The guys that are going to beat him are going to be the guys that can dog him, and that's going to be a tough equation. So, Yeah. Uh, we're both high on Virgil. Um, I, it's one A and one B, um, and they're in the same weight class, uh, Boots and Virgil. And one hopes that three or four years from now we're doing, you know, a show about a mega fight between those two. Uh, God, the it's not that the wow factor is not there. Uh, I think he's complete. Um, there's nothing that I have seen that I take away. So it's funny, it's it's kind of like when you're looking at, uh, you know, making a draft pick with two quarterbacks. You've got one that's like super flashy, probably, you know, won the Heisman. He, he, he makes errors, but he, his highlight reel's crazy. That's that's how I look at, like, he's freaky, right? And that's how I look at Boots Ennis. I go, wow, every time I watch him. Virgil, I look at him, and I'm like, yep, everything, he checks all the boxes. He would be like the 6'5 quarterback, you know, from the South, that you're like, oh, yeah, this guy, he's, he's, he's everything that you'd want. It's like packaged in a box. Virgil Ortiz has got a, just everything, and I, I love him to death. So it's 1A and 1B for me. I, I – I, I think that boxing fans, if they're listening to a show like this and they're saying, oh, okay, I cut some names that I wouldn't have thought so, da da da, da but 
these are the two guys that you're going to be seeing with that weight class, with the welterweight class getting old. Spence, who knows what he's going to be getting out of it. You know, gosh, look at the names at the top. Sean Porter, Ugas, you know, and, and Bud, who's not getting those fights. These two kids are coming in, and they're going to be around for a while. And that's going to be your fun welterweights that you're going to be seeing for a long time. So get to know them now if you don't, because uh, they've got everything. And, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't be higher on two kids. That welterweight uh, division is going to remain fun for years to come. Yeah, it's, it's going to be it's going to be very exciting. So where can people follow you? Where can people follow me? Well, the best place to get content uh, is Twitter, and that's at Ringwalk John. That's J O N. Uh, the Ringwalk podcast, it's all over. So, and if you follow it on Twitter, you're going to see the links for that. And uh, when fights return, it's a really fun show. <laughs> so that would be the best place to get uh, to get the content. Uh, but you know, just like yourself, probably we're we're finding ways to stay uh, engaged with our listeners and you know the people that. Uh, are wanting boxing content. There's only so much we can create, but when the time comes, I do love to handicap boxing too. That's uh, that's probably why half of the people listen to the show is to try to make some money, and so we do a lot of that too. So it's at Ring Lock John, and uh, yeah, I I really appreciate being able to come on, Lukey, and uh, give you my mock top two plus another eight, <laughs> you know, list, and uh, it was fun, man. 